is Craigie Coletta and I received the 2019 Active Environmental Solutions Postgraduate Award. This award meant that I could complete my Master's of Occupational Hygiene and Toxicology at Edith Cowan University. I strongly encourage everyone who is completing postgraduate studies or looking to start them to apply for this generous award. With this support, you can go a long way. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Zachary Debris. I'm the uh, State Liaison Officer for Queensland South. And today we have an AIOH webinar, What's in a Code of Practice? Um, the presentation is by Andrea Fox, who's the Director of Work and Electrical Safety Policy at the Office of Industrial Relations. Uh, and uh, before we have that, uh, we've got a few words from the AIOH. This is the 2021 Council, uh, headed up by Ross D. Coletto as president. And uh, those are the um, president-elect treasurer and secretary, Kate Cole, Alex Trudorovic, and Sharon Johnson with our councillors, Marcus Brooks, Melanie Windhurst, and Kelly Johnstone. Uh, and uh, the office team as well, Bo Alicia and Craig Price. The conference, 2021 conference is Sydney this year, running from the 27th of November to the 1st of December. Uh, the um, conference is open uh, for, um, for, for participation and, and you can get your tickets now. Um, and it is, uh, is it always going to be, be a great event for the year. So I encourage you to, to get in early and, and get those early bird specials. The North Queensland State Chapter Meeting. Uh, September looks like a pretty busy month. It's going to be on asbestos contaminated gases, gaskets, uh, a review of the process from identification to removal. Uh, 
And we have a masterclass, real-time monitoring, a practical guide on the 22nd of September. So look out for those in your inbox and uh, encourage you to, to sign up and, and go to those as well. We have our basic principles occupational hygiene courses. We've still got the Brisbane and Sydney uh, available for um, participation. Uh, so get into those if you, if you are interested. Uh, but finally, what's in a code of practice today's subject? So Andrea Fox is the Director of Work, Health and Electrical Safety Policy at the Office of Industrial Relations. She's been a policy professional for 20 years, originally commencing in the space as an econ economist uh, with a labour econo uh, economics background. Um, Andrea worked for many years in the economic policy for the Department of Premier Cabinet and has worked across a range of portfolios uh, from transport and main roads through to child protection. She has been with the Office of Industrial Relations, Workplace Health and Safety Queensland for four years. So I'm just gonna invite Andrea to start up to video and unmute herself and I will stop sharing so she can start the presentation. Hi, Zach. Hey, hey everybody. I hope everyone can hear me and um, see me. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, in When we work in policy, we often talk about not really um, sharing behind the scenes the making of sausages in the sausage factory because it all looks a little bit messy, but um, I actually think it's a really valuable area to learn about and I'm really um, very flattered by the level of interest in this topic. Um, I'm going to be talking to you uh, and I'm going to kind of, um, I'll, I'll try and not make it too dry, I'll try and sort of make it a little bit juicy for you, but um, I'll talk about um, what are the sort of fundamentals of the policy making space and then, you know, how that translates into legislation and then our space in it as a regulator. And then sort of I'll come, I'll hone in then on that code of the two codes of practice that are relevant to your space in this area, which are which are related to silica. So I'll kind of set the scene about how this stuff comes about and, and where um, occupations like yourselves fit into that space. So I'm going to try and um, share screen, which will be my first step. All right, is that showing up everyone or if someone wouldn't mind, is Zach maybe letting, Zachary letting you know? Yeah, that's showing up, thanks. Andrew. Beautiful, okay. Um, so thank you very much for that. And there'll be, yeah, time for questions at the end. And I think Zachary's gonna try and monitor questions as they come in and assist me with that. So if you, yeah, if you've got a really burning one, but otherwise we'll definitely have time at the end um, to get to it. So, um, I won't go into great depth about policy, but just in case it's kind of a, um, you're well outside of government and that's a bit of a new term that's used. Basically, all, all government policy refers to is it's, um, it's a way of approaching a particular um, situation, problem, area that, problem or area that a government wants to um, manage, intervene in, um, make a decision on, have a view on. And so it's just, a, it's like a strategic, um, map of what government's position is on this space and what it wants to do. And that can translate into legislation or it can translate into funding programs or, or whatever. But that's basically what policy means. Um, and as you could see from Zachary's introduction um, to me, generally policy professionals, we have a particular set of tools that you can then translate to different areas. And, this, and the science of policy, I guess, um, it, it is pretty much the same everywhere in the Australian Westminster system. So you can sort of move from portfolio to portfolio and then you work with content experts like yourself. So this is about how is policy made? Um, and I'll start with what tends to drive policy. Where, where does policy momentum come from? Um, and as you can see from the slide, the biggest one is the minister's direction, the minister that we work under and their portfolio and what their approach and their beliefs are around this space and what they want to do or achieve or what their concerns were coming into this space. Um, so ministerial direction is the big one. National process is another big one, very relevant to our space, particularly because we have model work, health and safety laws. Um, and also because we manage a couple of pieces of legislation in our space, in our department, which is the Office of Industrial Relations, I'm in the work, health and safety end of it. 
Um, you've also got things like um, where federal legislation overrides state and those sorts of things. So lots of national processes also drive um, policy in our space. Recommendations and reviews is a big one. One of the approaches that government uses, obviously, when they're deciding on that policy, like what will be our, our approach or our solution or our intervention in this space is to get a review undertaken. It can be taken internally in government, but you will probably know that it's very popular these days to get an external reviewer. Um, and then economic or industry developments, you have something like a pandemic. I mean, that obviously drives policy. So things that can happen outside of the government's control or sphere. Um, significant events, big one for us in our space, of course, was the tragic events of Dreamworld. And it ended up driving an entire review and huge significant changes around legislation and around approach, including codes of practice that we'll be talking about today. And then coroner's reports and judicial reviews. And I think sometimes um, um, from outside of government, it's probably um, not as visible, but a but few things um, stir fear in a minister, <laughs> like a coroner's report. A coroner um, looks at um, a fatality and makes recommendations. And often those recommendations will be criticisms or identification of where they see gaps in the way government's managing something. Um, ministers are highly responsive to coronial reports because they have that level of judicial strength behind them, but also um, it's, it, um, does speak to community expectations. If you didn't respond to a coroner's recommendation and there was another fatality, that would be a highly embarrassing event for a minister to look at and say that I didn't correct it the first time around and, and now we have another death. Um, policy decision makers is the next one I just want to touch on quickly. A lot of people um, often think if, if, if you're not, if you're the director of work, work health and safety policy, sure you make the decision. Um, and um, sometimes lobbyists will treat it that way with me. Um, I, I am entrusted, of course, with, with some degree of influence in this space, but we're not the decision makers around policy. Ministers are, and ultimately, if it's a significant policy decision or involves legislation, it's a cabinet room that makes the decision on it. Even a minister can't just arbitrarily decide what he or she, in my case, I work for a female minister, what Minister Grace wants to do in her space if it's if it's significant, if it involves big amounts of money, if it's a whole of government or other departmental implications, and if it involves legislative change. She can't make that decision alone. She has to go to cabinet and we have to persuade a room in cabinet. And then of course, if it involves legislative change, it goes to parliament. So again, you go through another form of review and decision making um, through the parliamentary process. As a policymaker, um, we subscribe to kind of a policy cycle. You might have heard of this approach, the sort of a theoretical approach to how policy is made. And it puts great weight, great strength in the evidence-based approach to making policy decisions. So identifying what the issues are, identifying what the concerns are, what, what is a problem, and then identifying what the options are, pros and cons of them, weighing that up, uh, providing some policy analysis and a preferred option. So I want to sort of make clear that it is underpinned by an evidence-based approach, but um, I think it's really important to understand that there are influences of the evidence-based approach as we go through policy making the whole way along. Um, because you're, yes, you're looking at technical input from occupations like yourselves, if it's a question relevant to this area, but um, you need to also be mindful of what level of expertise or, or experience is coming from, from which areas and how, therefore, how persuasive their evidence is able to be. And part of your job as a policymaker is to try and identify where certain types of evidence might be being disadvantaged in the process. So it's actually good quality evidence, but it doesn't come with um, as much firepower or something behind it. So experience and expertise involved for everybody who's involved in the policymaking space is highly relevant. Resources is, is another big one. Is it being given enough time and consideration? Um, there's been a very big uh, trend across um, Australian governments probably downsizing their policy spaces. And so that does um, make us a bit more vulnerable, I think, to um, the resourcing for quality um, policy making here. And also, I think it speaks to another element of it, which is that when you sign up for a policy position of senior policy position in the government, you um, sign up to an ethos we have, which is basically frank and fearless advice. And that's a fundamental part of the Westminster um, system is that 
as public servants, we are providing frank and fearless advice and we're not biased by um, particular influences. But the degree to which you can kind of protect and maintain that obviously also depends a little bit on the capability and the strength of your policy space. Can they take um, a brave stand on something? Values are very important. Um, there's two major sides of government in Australia and they have um, lots of overlap but there's uh, very significant areas where they have fundamental differences in their values. And so depending on which government comes in, you, you, the entire um, government policy agenda can be, is naturally orientated towards particular values of, of what is the government that's been elected. Interestingly, in this space, um, if you are looking at what is the core difference between the two sides of government in Australia, it really does come down to um, their, their values, their beliefs around workplace relations. Work health and safety sits right in the centre of that and probably was a more neutral space um, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. But as we've seen big shifts happen in the industrial relations legislation, um, we are definitely, and, I, and I'd say that from a policy space as well, we're definitely identifying a lot more politicisation of um, the work health and safety space because um, it's the crux of value differences between two sides of government and also the Work Health and Safety Act has certain powers in it which don't exist any longer in industrial relations legislation. And I think that's made us a very political space at times, um, which makes it very challenging for regulators, for departments, and, and probably for a lot of you who are working out there in industry as well. You probably get pulled into some industrial pension space from time to time. Um, the other influences of evidence policy making, definitely lobbyists and peak bodies. I don't think they'll be a surprise to anybody. Um, they're part of the family of politics um, and they do perform very important roles. Um, they're obviously empowered about being able to deliver messages from the community to government. Um, and pragmatics and contingencies, you can, you can policy space is not one for purists because um, you start with a brilliant idea, which is evidence-based and it's that preferred option and that we've all put together and you manage to convince your minister, your minister's on board, but you can't control some of the pragmatics and contingencies that will happen along the way. So there might be, well, you might have a border close, <laughs> you might have that interrupts elements of your um, policy making space. You might have um, another minister or department or even a federal um, doing something significant in that space at that time. So you have to stop and wait and, and come after what they've done. And that changes the way you're approaching whatever the particular problem is you're trying to solve and those sorts of things. So policy starts as like this beautiful idea and it goes, yes, it goes through dents and knocks and, um, and it goes through lots of trade-offs and lots of negotiation and lots of different input. And then you arrive at this kind of uh, option at the end that doesn't always resemble what you started with as a policymaker. You have to be quite a flexible, adaptable person. But generally, I'm a believer that um, more, more views involved makes better policymaking. I don't believe in governments making policy in isolation. So as difficult as that is, and as we don't always get the exact thing I would have liked as a policy outcome, I still think overall that democratic process is very important and we get much better decision making by having more people involved. So the other thing I just wanted to note here is that we in the department, we put up policy options and recommendations and it's the right of the government not to follow those recommendations. So not everything we put forward is endorsed. They'll often choose their own option and um, we're aware that that government was voted in. They were trusted with making that decision um, and it's our job as public servants to then um, assist them with making the, the option they've chosen. Policy making questions, I think this one is important because sometimes your occupation will get pulled into elements of the policy making process and you might not be aware of exactly what we're trying to glean from you as we sort of talk to um, technical professionals like yourselves, what sorts of stuff we're trying to look for or um, address. So these are some of the questions that I have to answer in order to defend a policy decision that our ministers made and actually get it through government, those policy decision makers that I was talking about. So one of them is that other departments get to review the proposal you're putting forward and they'll look at the quality of the evidence and whether it satisfies them. And they are not, strong departments are not shy about questioning and arguing with you about your, your case for something, your evidence for something. Um, 
Another element is that they like it to be quite measured, um, deliberate decision making. They don't want things rushed because they want you to have already looked at what might be um, unintended outcomes. Um, do we have a sense of what the impact is? Did we make assumptions that we don't really have evidence to demonstrate why we've made those assumptions? Um, do we even know what the starting point on this problem was? Because remember that public policy is addressing very complex questions. So we might have, this question might have come to our attention via a coroner's report or via a lobbyist or, um, or a minister's particular bent, but we're coming into it at this point what was happening before it and um, what is the full story that's happening here. Fit and consistency with existing priorities. Community hates inconsistent direction by government for very good reasons. So is what we're trying to do consistent with the messages across the whole government, consistent with what we've done previously as a regulator under a government? So that's, I'll just say that when governments change, a few of these bets are off. Um, pressure points that you're going to run into, have you thought about them, what you're going to do? A narrative, which is kind of a nuanced, um, a nuanced element to policy making, and it can be, um, it's a, it's an interesting space because in policy teams, I employ lots of different occupations. Um, like Zachary said, I, I started as an economist, so that's where I came from. But I've got scientists in the team. We've had well, lots of lawyers. Um, we've had people who had like nursing backgrounds. We've had people who'd come from occupational hygienist areas, those sorts of things as well. There's a Cert, and so basically a policymaker needs to be able to think, research, write, but there's this other part of policymaking that's this bit, narrative, can you tell a story? And it's different to spin. It actually means, can you make a compelling case for what you're doing? So yes, it's an evidence-based decision. It's a good one. You know it's a good one. But how will you convince people? Because you'll need to make it make sense. You'll need it to make it simple. How will you explain, there's always winners and losers out of any decision in government. How will you explain that the decision for the winners is better for all than the impact on the losers? So it's this element is actually a really um, important part of policy making. And it often means that we ask a lot of questions of um, our technical space around this about tell us more about what's happening in this and then what happens with that and what would it look like if we did that because we're trying to sort of after we've already considered the evidence that's put forward we're trying to start building up what will be the narrative how do you explain what we're doing to people because you have to take Queensland along with you on the journey about why you're doing something that you're doing. We don't have to go to, through this one in any great depth, but I guess the um, this is just to show you this is the this is the making of legislation, and I guess there's a couple of points I just would say out of this. One is um, when you've got you've got your policy case, it's good evidence, everybody agrees to it. We've got support from the minister. We may have even support from the cabinet, but there's many steps it has to go through if it involves legislative change, and for good reason you don't want governments arbitrarily changing legislation all the time. But essentially, um, this is just to sort of let you know why it can take, you know, six months, a year, in some cases, 18 months before you actually get that legislative change in process. And so it goes through a, a couple of forms of argument, basically, that you have to defend it with. One is the regulatory impact statement, which is a, like a business case assessment what are the costs of what you're doing? Who get who bears the costs? What are what are the flow-on costs? How will market the market adjust to this? How would it respond to this? So, if you're thinking about something in the space of, say, um, workplace exposure standards or or such, what you're needing to be thinking about is okay, you've made a good decision. This is the workplace exposure standard. It's based on good good research. Um, how are businesses actually going to adapt to it? Where will they, is the technology readily available for them? Do, are, there, is, are the occupational hygienists available in regional areas? Are there, it's all these kinds of things that a regulatory impact state assessment will look at. And it will look at um, particularly whether governments are over-regulating. Um, so have you reached too far and started to regulate an area that you don't need to? Um, it also involves public consultation if it goes through a RIS, so that's a chance, and it's a really important part of the features of government. It's a chance for community, businesses, workers, particular agencies, bodies, to have a voice back and say how it affects them and what their thoughts are. You go to Cabinet three times. Um, you go to get a 
to win the case for the policy change and then you go to cabinet to show how you're intending to draft legislation to meet that and you have to get their approval each time and even after you've done all that you need to go back to cabinet again to get approval to take that draft legislation on its way to parliament um, so in each case there's a lot of negotiation there's a lot of questions raised concerns raised that you're having to sort of address the whole way through and then, of course, in Queensland, we have the parliamentary committee system that it gets referred to, which is a little bit like a Senate process, I guess, in that um, uh, for the first time, government has to take its um, case to, to formally to members of the opposition because parliamentary committees are made up of uh, members from across the floor. So... Um, you, you may have got a grilling in the cabinet room, you may have convinced your cabinet colleagues, now you've got to go and convince the other side of government as well. And that parliamentary committee reviews what you're doing, they can ask questions, they can get you to go and do further changes to your submission, they can end up getting you to change the legislation, all sorts of things. You go through that process, media is involved by that stage, you're starting to sort of face a bit of the pub test, the reality of what you're trying to do. And that, that's where that narrative for why you're doing this, why should we interrupt the flow of everything? Why is it important? What are we going to get from it as a, as a state? Um, that part happens. Then you get a, a debate in Parliament where, again, you get another little grilling. Um, the minister does anyway. <laughs> um, and the bill goes um, uh, through the Act of Parliament, becomes an assent. Um, this, this is an area I just wanted to sort of highlight just a handful of the things because... I don't just work for a policy space in a department, I work for a policy space with a, with a regulator and I think there's some significant distinctions there because you kind of have an additional role I think as public servants when you're working for a regulator because they are, um, they are directly regulating how people go about living their lives and making decisions, prosecutions, you know, infringements, able to find people. So that's, a, you know, I think that's that extra layer that's um, interesting in this space. And some of the problems I want to talk about that a WHS regulator faces in these contemporary times, really fast paced change, which you guys know all about in your space, a lot of increased complexity. I mean, we're dealing in a completely different regulatory environment to say 50 years ago. Um, cross borders, as we know now, it's cross borders internationally, but also across states. So products, services, people, companies, they're working across. So you can't regulate like an island anymore. You have to be thinking about your place in the space with other regulators. Um, the second one I just wanted to highlight, and this is probably not news to you guys as well with your, um, with your uh, academic backgrounds, but I think there has been a long over-reliance in the work health and safety space, an over-reliance on human error as the cause. And that means that there's also been a very strong um, reliance on solutions through influencing behavioural change. And the reality is that we don't get a lot of success out of influencing behavioural change alone and people if you're not fixing up the systems around it that incentivise particular behaviours or not. Um, a very difficult part of the space for regulators is the speed of media um, and the contestability of ideas. So it, there's just no doubt about it that compared to when I first started my career in policy to now, um, government has a lot less control over the generation of ideas and how its ideas uh, delivered or communicated to people. And that's largely good. Um, that's a very democratic development in information and communication. But you can imagine that also means that you can easily have your what you're trying to do interrupted by false information. You can have it interrupted by um, very strenuous um, criticism from very small parts of a population that are actually affected that sort of override the discussion about what's happening for the broader population. So just elements like, like that make it difficult to be in the regulator space. I, I just wanted to highlight the problems of under-regulation, which is um, self-regulation works in some spaces really well. Um, I don't think anybody should be in the business of removing the, um, the value of self-regulation. I think when it's situated in the right framework, it's a very effective way of achieving regulation. But there's no doubt about it that where you have um, 
where so where there's not a fair sort of level playing field, I guess particular voices are going to be stronger than others, and you won't necessarily you'll get you'll get market failure. Um, I'm an economist, so <laughs> I won't hesitate to use that term. Um, and I think another interesting thing that's happened in the work health and safety space is that community expectations have changed greatly over the last couple of decades in term, in Australia anyway, um, in terms of what they expect out of safety and their risk tolerance. And I think there's a much, it's, it's a very fast road from incident occurred to government, who's in charge, what are you doing about it, Why, what can you do to stop this? Um, and I think also if you think about the dynamics of work have changed so much um, over those last couple of de decades, there's very few places now in your life that aren't a workplace really um, and that can't be part of a workplace. So the degree, the expectations of what government will cover, what, what work health and safety inspectors will cover has, has massively grown. We're not just talking about big business work sites, we're talking about people's homes um, and then I want to talk about overregulation because I'm a very strong believer in policy space that you um, in government you are charged with a very high responsibility here and I think you do need to constantly check your own um, motivations and your own decisions so insufficient protections for privacy um, people's privacy, their, their data, their information in systems. Um, we have very strong powers as a regulator to um, compel uh, evidence and to compel data in the case of investigations. So something you have to take that responsibility very seriously. Um, avenues for procedural justice, can you question our decisions? Um, what if we get it wrong? Are you allowed to appeal those decisions? Those sorts of things. Um, inaccessible human face to the regulator. I don't think that's one that our regulator suffers from. I mean, you might might have different view, but I actually think having looked across a number of regulators, I think probably the work health and safety space is quite an accessible human face, but, um, and regulatory scope creep, that kind of tendency, what's a great way to fix problems? Regulation. So there can be a tendency sometimes um, to over-regulate, to go, well, we'll start regulating this space or community expectations wants this regulated and those sorts of things. I'm not saying that we do it, but I am saying that I think it's that scope creep is something I'm constantly monitoring in our work. Um, how do you make it better? <laughs> um, you've got to lift the skills of your policy and legislators, um, their policy skills all the time, because you, you won't get that really kind of good inquiry, that really good analysis. Um, if you're not constantly lifting the skills of the people who are doing it for you. And I would go so far as to say peak bodies, um, I would encourage any peak body that is going to be participating in discussions about things like exposure standards, about things like dust, disease, um, to have a relationship with, with occupational hygienists, to be hiring them, to help, to help shape their thinking and to help represent their views when they're in discussions with us. I think the more that you have um, people with the expertise in the room and we're at the problem solving consultation stage, the better. It's... Um, it's very difficult when technical people are right outside the conversation and it's starting to get into very technical space. Um, you need to rely on independent expertise. I would put in here also stay curious. Um, I think as a policymaker inside government or anybody inside government, I should say, because I think there's a tendency at times, it's a, you can probably see already from the slides, it can be an exhausting process. It can be a process of a lot of um, hurdles and a lot of, um, uh, concessions and that's it's very exhausting and I think when that happens it's easy to sort of go I just don't want the trouble of this of this uh, particular group of people who are trying to make their their views heard and who are kind of doing it clumsily doing it irritatingly um, but I'm very mindful and I really push it very strongly with my team okay, delivery not great by, by these people about the views that they're trying to put forward, but what are they trying to say? It's really urgent to them. It's your job to try and understand what perspective they're bringing to this because you don't want to eliminate a view just because we're that far down the track and we, you know, everybody's already made a decision where all peak bodies and departments are on board. You want to still stay curious, are we getting this right? Um, Evidence-based policy analysis, as I said, evaluate what you decide to do and make sure you go back and go, did it work? Did it solve the problem? Is it, is it working well? Um, 
the other ones probably speak for themselves and sure regulators have powers and protection to use those powers but their decision making needs to be transparent they need to be accountable um, there's two things I just want to highlight there that I think are really critical in the work health and safety space and one of them is that orange box uh, this act the WHS Act is really interesting because it assigns everybody a duty to achieve a health safe, the health and safety outcomes in it. It says everybody is part of that in their work site. And it actually has a whole section of the Act built around um, consultation models with workers. And I think that's a critical area to achieving work health and safety outcomes. And it needs constant injection of momentum because people hate conflict. They hate getting in there and having to face difficult discussions. They hate everybody getting in a room and sort of it makes it messy. It makes it tiring. But that's where you start unpacking what's the real cause of work health and safety problems that are occurring and what might be better ways of doing it. Um, I'd also put in a shout for the hierarchy of controls. We don't think all, all approaches are equal. We know some approaches work better than others. And I'd speak back to that point I made earlier about there's been an over-reliance on human error and human behavioural change as a solution, we know the best, best outcomes we've ever had in health and safety were around engineering controls. Um, and the other one is the one that gets us to codes, collaboration between regulators and those who we're going to regulate. We need to be problem solving together. I think that's where you get your best solutions. Office of Industrial Relations um, has a very strong, and especially in the work health and safety area, a very strong leaning towards a collaborative approach to policy making. Um, that's partly, uh, well, a big part of it would be attributed to the minister. She has a personal um, uh, preference for that approach. Um, doesn't mean governments or ministers always give everybody what they wanted. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who'll be able to say they didn't get what they liked, but. Um, but she is a minister that does not like surprises. Um, so we do a highly uh, collaborative approach to policy making. We meet and discuss through a whole range of forums, the policy making as it develops. We've got a board that sits over us. We have industry sector standing committees that inform the various areas of um, particular industries that have risks. We, as you'll see, our code development process is highly collaborative for that reason. Um, the good thing about, I'm a very firm believer in collaborative policy making. Um, I think you get good decisions, solutions often coming out of it and they last because people were part of the story. It wasn't something that, you know, in the isolation of government, you just, you just uh, imposed on people. So I think they stay possibly wedded to it for longer. Um, I think you get more innovative solutions, more people thinking about it, bound to get more ideas come out of it. Um, Less surprises, like I said, shared ownership of the outcomes. Um, ideally, it builds better relationships between government state and its stakeholders. Um, of course, the opposite can happen. The more we all get together and we try and discuss what can be really difficult problems that people have very strong views on, you also, it's there's a lot of risk of conflict. So um, I won't deny that. The cons of it is extremely time consuming and energy consuming. And that's for us, and that's for everybody outside. It's hours and hours and hours of engagement. If you're going to draft legislation or develop policy documents with a group of people, um, I think power imbalances can frustrate participants. Government has more power in the room than its other participants that can frustrate people. But even amongst stakeholders, certain stakeholders have more power, more um, they are more connected, they're more organised, they're more mobilised, so they have a bigger voice um, than others in the room. So you have to be very careful of managing the process to make sure everyone gets a say. Um, and the other one's probably not so relevant to you guys, but just to say that it's an intense form of consultation, but it's not a broad form of consultation necessarily, even though you've got lots of people there in the room who are representing, you know, ideally thousands of membership. As we all know, there's always people who are left out who aren't members of clubs, associations, organisations, um, unions, you know, there's, there's people who didn't join those and what's happening with their voices in the process. Um, I hope I'm going on okay for time. Just let me know if I'm, I'm, I'm getting towards the end, um, but let me know if I've really overestimated it. We've, we've um, developed a couple of codes that will be of particular interest, well, We've developed one and in the process of developing one that will be of particular interest to you. This is the silica stone bench top um, code, and we're now doing the silica and construction code. 
And this is just to show you, um, Brad Guy and it's thought there'd be some interest in understanding how we go about developing these codes of practice. Um, for anybody who's totally new to the space, um, codes of practice are almost like um, the industry codes of practice. They tend to be uh, focused on either particular sectors of, um, of work or particular topics of work. Um, so silica and construction is a good example, but you might have another one like mobile crane code of practice or psychosocial hazards code of practice. They're almost like a Bible of um, what are the hazards we see as a regulator and how do we expect you to approach them? What do we expect you to be doing about them? And the thing about codes of practice in Queensland, as opposed to other jurisdictions, is that after Dreamworld, when I mentioned before, that really drove a huge policy. It was a big policy driver. Legislation changed, which enshrined codes in our legislation. So they're not guides. They are part of law. They can be enforced. They'll be called up in court cases and prosecutions. And so um, that's under 26A in our Work Health and Safety Act. That means codes are kind of meeting numerous audiences needs at once. They need to be super accessible because a business needs to be able to pick them up who might not have a very strong background in work health and safety. A worker needs to be able to put, pick it up and understand what's in there. Um, if people can't understand it, they can't follow it, they won't follow it. Um, but they will also need to, they need to be um, legally defendable. They need to um, not misrepresent the legislative um, arm in there. So like I said, they're kind of used by multiple audiences at once. They're used by our inspectorate. They're used by um, workplaces. They're used in courts. They're used by lots of people at once. And so they're having to sort of meet a couple of, quite a few needs at once. Um, the other thing I'd say about, um, what was I going to say about codes? So the, I think I've got through most of my points about codes. Um, they're really, um, they're really, great documents in that they do, people get some reassurance out of knowing what the regulator is expecting. It does a lot of the heavy lifting for, for people out there. Um, but if you're developing a code of practice, because it is enforceable, people will um, bite hard on what goes into a code. If you're thinking about external unions and um, the employer representatives, because they know the weight of the code and the significance of it in that space. Um, our codes, we get the, the early stage is kind of like just a project planning stage is identification of what the issues are. It's a literature review, it's a data review. There's no surprise to anybody who's kind of um, studied and done research at uni. It's that kind of process. Like you're kind of figuring out what, what is the space? What's the need? What are the gaps? What, what the literature is saying are going to be the concerns? What will this code particularly need to speak to? We also go and talk to our committees, those industry sector standing committees who have an interest in the area. We talk to the inspectors. We talk to people like Zachary. Um, we ask, what are you seeing? What are the concerns? What do you need? What do you think this code will need to do? And then we form a steering group, which is um, tripartite. It's made up of industry, union representatives, technical experts, um, and OIR, us as, as a government are represented on as well. Now that steering group gets ticked off by the minister. So the steering group doesn't have a voting power, but it has a very significant power in um, developing the code because they're getting a very big voice in it. So we need to make sure we've got good coverage in the steering group, but it's not too big. We need to make sure we've got ethical players in the steering group, people who you know don't have a good work health and safety record. Um, we need good independent technical experts, people who are not captured by either side who can give nice, good, neutral evidence. Um, and what, what they do is they identify the key concerns, those real world practical considerations, and we start drafting a code around that. And it goes backwards and forwards through steering group mem meetings where they get to have a look as we take what they're saying and we put, put into words with our other stuff, which is a code is also a, um, a document that tells you all the legislation in our space that applies to you. So it does that heavy lifting as well. It tells you what parts of the act are relevant here, what parts of the regs are, um, what Australian standards you should be aware, aware of. And so it does all that legwork for you. So we put that together, it goes backwards and forwards through a steering group. We have another group called a reference group. Um, and that's a broader group that doesn't have to do all the kind of the nitty gritty of those meetings, those hard yards ones, but gets to see drafts of the document as we get towards the end and gets to put give us input that goes back to the steering group. So they get to say, from my perspective, I'm looking at this, this doesn't make sense to me. Or from my particular niche area of industry, you haven't captured this, it's not in there. 
Um, so we have that much bigger reference group um, that get to see it and have input. And then we sort of workshop with their stuff. We use something called sprints uh, at various points towards the end when you start to get to those really um, uh, difficult patches where there's lots of contention or, or there's, there's not a very clear path through something, a solution. We use sprints, which is sort of we get together with very um, sessions kind of in um, quick sequential where we kind of work, work through those things. At the end, it goes through a regulatory assessment. So once we've got a working draft of the code, um, a little bit like what I was talking to you before about with the steps that legislation goes through, codes are quasi legislation. So they do get assessed by um, the Office of Best Practice, who looks at it, that business case kind of argument, that sort of stuff. Um, we go through all that. Um, it goes through an internal um, consideration inside our department to look at the operational features. Does it work? Could it be used operationally? Are there concerns around any of the enforcement actions? Is there any misrepresentation of the legal elements? Is that all correct? And then we finally take something to the minister for her approval. And if she's okay with it, um, it goes through a process where it, um, it goes through numerous checks and balances before it becomes um, basically part of the legislation and it's announced. And I, I can go to, into that in any more detail if you needed. Um, so it's a bloody miracle that we get through all those steps in 12 months <laughs> because um, like I said, steering groups don't always work well together either. Like, you know, that everybody's got their heart in it, but that also means that they're often there to really um, hold out for something that they're wanting in it. Um, this part of it, oh, sorry, I didn't. Um, what happens with a new code of practice that's implemented? Um, my part in it starts to come to a bit of a halt, but not the departments. There's lots of media um, needs to go out. There's they, we do information workshops with industry. We do presentations. We do um, guidance material might go out about it. All those sorts of stuff. Enforcement campaigns go around it. The inspectors need to be trained in it, and out they go and they start doing enforcement around it, making sure that people are complying with the code and the expectations in there. Um, sometimes codes will have a transitional period. So there'll be a time between we say, this is what the new position is by the regulator on this. This is a new code, explains what's expected of you. Um, and you've got some time to get ready and, and be ready for that process. Um, I'll just put this one up because I, I don't need to necessarily sort of broadcast the, the government's approach to respiratory crystalline silica, but this is, I guess this just shows you that the, the steps we've gone through in this space, you've got 2018 when there was those, we were starting to see those really alarming numbers starting to come through of diagnoses. You had the minister get up in parliament, make an announcement, we're doing something immediately, very concerned. Um, you got the code of practice started being developed. We started auditing all stone bench shops immediately in, in several phases to find out what was happening in industry, get people away from dry control cutting. Um, then you have the code comes out. Um, you do a follow up audit to check whether there's compliance with the code. You have the commencement of the National Dust Disease Task Force as a national approach it was driven then. Um, the minister came out and announced that actually she was going to do a follow-up code, which was to take into account silica and construction. And um, you've had some, you know, recent changes, I guess, around this space, more audits, um, workplace exposure standards change across Australia. Um, and that's where we are now, 2021. That's it for me. I can, um, I hope that wasn't too long. Um, do have a couple of questions, Andrea, and okay. uh, most are from Russell okay. Bond, but I invite anyone uh, that had questions just to type them in the chat and I can, um, I can ask them. But uh, Russell's first question was, um, it must be difficult to give frank and fearless advice in a climate of significant ideological difference between mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. How much does that have an effect on the advice you give? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, it is, yeah, it is difficult. I mean, you, I always think there's a, um, and I, I always, you always hope that a government that comes in actually understands the value of frank and fearless advice because um, I always think you're better off hearing what might be the things that are going to trip you up, even if you've completely made up your mind as a government and you think this is it, we're doing this, it's, you know, significant 
reform, we're doing it, don't care what you say, public servants. And there's often a lot of distrust of public servants when new governments come in, I won't, I won't lie. Um, it's, yeah, I guess it's about sort of building that trust and, um, but also the case for it, which is you're going to either hear the problem when it's out there, when you've done it, or you might want to hear it before that happens. Um, I can't speak to what, you know, how directors general, I guess, maintain that, but certainly I feel almost like we sign up, well, I do, a code of conduct as, as a professional, and I would refuse to sign off on advice that didn't, didn't represent mine. So I'm, I'm always very happy to say there's other ways of looking at this, but yes. Um, so it, it does rely upon, um, yeah, quite a lot of uh, fortitude, but also people above you protecting your right to deliver Frank and Phyllis. But I've got to say that um, I hope it's comfort to you to know that on the whole, uh, working in the Queensland government, I have found they have, ministers have been receptive to, you know, advice that wasn't necessarily advice they wanted to hear. Um, yeah, so only occasionally was I aware of watching it go up the chain, <laughs> um, it dissolving. Um, another question from Russell. Um, when there's a rapidly changing environment uh, and it's not reasonable or possible to understand all the risk at that particular time, how, how is that, um, how do you handle those situations where mm. not all is known about a risk? Um, that's a really, that's a really good question. And if you ask a couple of different positive people, get probably, I guess, slightly different answers to that. Um, I think it's about identifying what you don't know in the space. So it's providing analysis of what you've considered and what's part of it, but very much, um, alerting decision makers to the fact that there's a component here you don't know about. Um, I think that's quite a significant part of government decision-making because, um, and I don't want to sound too cynical, but when I talked before about the role of peak bodies and, and lobbyists, and so I do actually feel very strongly they perform a really critical role. Um, however, they are good at getting heard. And I think that um, you've got to be very careful about what voices are being marginalised in the process. And that's, I guess, that being curious element. Um, I mean, another thing we do is we do rely upon technical experts. We can go back to them and say, okay, we don't, you know, you've given, you've given, we've got this bit of information. We don't know, like, what's your set? Like, good technical experts also sign up to a code, I feel like a professional code. And that's why where there's elements of our regulation that depend upon um, um, occupational hygienists, I feel a lot more comfort because I know there's a professional standing and they're actually part of, they part of, they're self-driven about the regulation, about the standards in it. But so I'll often ask them for an educated view, like, can you go out and talk to others, other occupation, other, sorry, other colleagues outside of government? Can you see what their views are? Like even some anecdotal stuff to help me flesh out the bits that we don't have data for. Like, what's your sense? Um, yeah, that's. Uh, Philip asked, and I think I know the answer to this one. Um, given the status of codes of practice, um, why do they not go the same or similar approval process as an act or reg? Mm. Um, it's an excellent question. Um, it does go through the same, yeah, it's a, it goes through that OBPR um, and the minister definitely looks at it from various aspects. But I think, um, I think it's a really good question. Part of the answer is a code of practice is actually supposed to capture existing legislative requirements. So that's part of the answer. Um, that it's just a way of collecting together what you're already having to meet. So I'm not bringing in new regulations. So uh, therefore, I don't have to go through that same level of review. But, you know, you start to untangle parts of codes and you have to have to think, well, is that strictly speaking the case? Because sometimes when you start to collect together the, the position on space or how it how it is to be interpreted, what our minimum standard is, it is starting to get closer and closer to that line of is it new regulation and that's certainly what OBPR considers when it goes to review um, I think um, yeah so the straightforward answer would be that it's supposed to just collect together existing standards um, the other answer the more nuanced answer I guess is yeah we are getting awfully close to the line I'm sure and I'm sure as people you know the appetite for codes as Zachary will be able to test you anybody at Office of Industrial Relations is so strong um, which I don't necessarily love because because there's so much like legislation, I don't think you should just create a million codes because essentially what you're doing is creating hundreds more pages of legislation and then you're expecting people out there 
Um, so please don't go around spreading anything to say that I don't believe in codes. I do. I think they're fantastic instruments. They're so dearly loved. You know, people would knock me over if I ever tried to stand in the way between industry and unions and codes. They love it. It's one of the few things they agree on. Um, but yes, you've got to be careful. Heaps, you know, add hundreds of pages. That means you guys have got to be across hundreds of pages. It means the people you're working for. It, it's, it is a, it's a regulatory creep problem. So what's the difference between um, getting a code approved versus uh, regulatory changes on a harmonised level? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. So um, regulatory changes and codes can both go through a regulatory impact statement. So they can go through a similar thing, the same thing that RIS, they can, codes can be sent out um, for public consultation. So same thing that a regulatory change would go through. The difference between um, our codes as Queensland's the only one that's enshrined them in the legislation. So um, it'd be no surprise to other states, we're a little bit cowboy here. And um, so we do our own thing with our own codes. We don't, you know, the ones that we've got, Queensland codes, we don't negotiate on that national level. So where you've got regs um, that are part of the national regulatory change, that's obviously all the regulators getting together and all the industry and social partners to discuss. So that's a bit of a difference. We can do what we want inside Queensland. Um, but they can go, yeah, they can both go through the RIS process if they're assessed as requiring it, that is having additional costs for people. Um, it, I, I think a lot of what you get out of the assessment processes of going to cabinet and parliament, not all of them, but a lot of them, you actually mimic by doing it with a steering group because the people out there who are going to debate and argue it and who, you know, want their members of parliament to speak up on it or, you know, department, those concerns start to get flushed out through a steering group process. I mean, we often have other departments on our steering groups or reference groups are as well. So a lot of what you would get out of that process happens through a steering group. Okay. Um, I think I might leave it there. There are some more questions, um, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll put them to Andrea's to, to consider and, and send back a response. Um, so I'll, um, I'll forward those, one out, those ones out. But, um, you know, lastly, I'd just really like to thank Andrea for, for taking us through the uh, process of a code of practice. I know I've, I've heard a little bit of that speech before, but I have still so many questions about how <laughs> this happens, and I'm, I'm 10 years in the regulator, so <laughs> there are nuances to, to, to this sort of um, policy making and, and this, this topic. Um, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you very much for, for attending all today, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll see you all soon, yeah, virtually, um, and maybe in person. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.